and we are live. This is Value After Hours. I'm Tobias Carlyle, joined as always by my esteemed co-host, yes, Jake Steve. Taylor. Our special guest today is Spencer Jacob. He's the editor of the Wall Street Journal's Heard on the Street, and he's got a book out. Uh, he's talking to us about GameStop, Roaring Kitty. How are you, Spencer? Good to see you. I'm good. Thanks for having me. It's great to be with you guys. Welcome. So the the book is called The Revolution That Wasn't. How, how, how why is it called the revolution? Spoiler alert. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> you told us how it ended. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, I think I failed book marketing 101 with, uh, with that one or, or the editors at, uh, at Penguin Random House did. I mean, if it wasn't, then why am I reading this? But I mean, that, that describes how this event was perceived and what it wasn't, which it wasn't a, a revolution. You know, if you journalists are, um, are accused of, of, um, sort of, you know, getting carried away with things. And they also said that we write the first draft of history. And the first draft was not really correct in, in this mm. case. I mean, the 80 to 90% of the kind of breathless coverage of the that initial meme stock squeeze was that they had turned the tables on Wall Street, that, that the things would always be, would be different, that that social media had, had changed the way things work. And, um, and that Wall Street had been given a black eye. And that, that just is not the case at all. Uh, I think every mania tends to extract wealth from the masses and transfer at least some of that wealth to, to Wall Street, Wall Street writ large. And, and this one did too. And I, that's something that people continue to not understand or don't want to understand about this, this episode. It's a fascinating story. It's, it's interesting for many, many reasons. And you know, I, I hesitate to say that, that some financial episode was different than all the ones that came before it, but so many things had to happen for this meme stock squeeze to, to occur. And, and so it was a real moment in, in history, financially, and just, just generally in history, but it wasn't a revolution. And that's, you know, the, in that sense, the title is, is correct. It's just not maybe, maybe not marketing uh, pixie dust. So there were if, some very high, pro, pro, high profile scalps. So Melvin Capital. Yeah. Uh, do you, Mel, Mel, Melvin Capital seems to have been taken down by, by, by GameStop at least. For sure. Yes. I mean, they're, they're you know, investing to some extent is a zero sum game, right? And they, uh, they got zeroed out almost. I mean, they, they lost close to $7 billion. This previously very successful hedge fund. And, and there were other people who, who got blown up on, on Wall Street. So I, I'm, I'm not saying that there weren't some very substantial losses a, as a result of the, the meme stock squeeze and GameStop mania. What I'm saying is that Wall Street um, is, is comprised of lots of different people. And, and most of the money on Wall Street is earned through fee income, through processing transactions, and you know, just kind of holding other people's money, and you know, the writ large, Wall Street made a ton of money in the run up to this event, during the event, and and following it, because you had all these young people, and it was mainly young people, rush into the market with their money and and lose lots of it, and even if they individually didn't all lose money, because many people did make money or on paper are still sitting on gains. It was uh, it was a very profitable event for Wall Street and for corporate insiders also, uh, which is something people forget. You know, people who just were really in the right place at the right time had some stock options, were sitting on the board of or in the on the you know in the C-suite of these companies that were kind of slowly going down the tubes, and all of a sudden lightning struck, and they walked away with a lot of money when they didn't expect to. Yeah, where did the um, so. How did they, the little investors, end up losing money? I mean, they just kept overpaying for shares of of GameStop, let's say, mm -hmm. or was it options that ended up going to, you know, expiring at zero? Well, I mean, the the whole episode really, if you want to kind of get back to its origins, begins in the you know, with the the pandemic, which emerged about a year earlier, not quite a year earlier. Um, Every brokerage in late 2019 went to zero commissions in the United States. Then in early 2020, you had the pandemic and you just had a rush of, of young people, more than 10 million accounts opened 
mainly places like Robinhood, but also E-Trade, Fidelity, Schwab, uh, eToro, what have you. Uh, a bunch of people who previously had not been interested in finance suddenly were very interested in it. Um, and there were many reasons for that. Part of that was just boredom. Part of that was that they had stimulus checks or other enforced savings with which they could invest. Uh, they were stuck on their phones for you know many hours, especially in the early part of the pandemic. They, uh, sports gambling had, had taken off. And suddenly all sports were off the air and they were looking for some other outlet. And we're talking really, really males between the ages of 18 and 35 were the kind of the vanguard of the group that, that sent GameStop to the moon. And they began doing all kinds of what you and I might consider dumb things with their money, with their investment accounts. And those dumb things turned out to be pretty profitable for a, a brief while. You know, if you look at, uh, for example, ending in, in you know the, the month of the GameStop uh, squeeze and beginning that March of 2020, or rather April of 2020, an index of unprofitable companies uh, maintained by Goldman Sachs, it was up almost 300%. Yeah. So the, the worst stuff did the best. And, you know, you had Warren Buffett, uh, who obviously has a fantastic long-term track record, being spooked out of airlines. Um, he dumped airlines close to the bottom. And, you know, in, in terms of, uh, of managing risk, probably it was the right move. In hindsight, it wasn't the right move. You know, you had a, an index of airline stocks jumping almost 100% in the, the following three months. So all the things that, that people who uh, their parents and grandparents may have respected, the kind of the, the talking heads on wise gray hairs saying you should and shouldn't do, Doing the opposite was very, very profitable. And you had a bunch of, of new influencers emerging on the scene and telling people to buy Hertz because it was, you know, even though it was bankrupt. Yeah. Uh, and it was basically, everyone agreed and it, it wound up actually making money, but everyone agreed it was worthless. And people plowed into Hertz, doubled or quadrupled their money in a matter of days. And, and all, all these reckless things made a lot of money. And the, peak of that was GameStop mania. So I guess I'm not talking specifically about GameStop. GameStop went from a $4 stock prior to the, the pandemic to as low as being a $2 stock to being a $4 stock, call it the summer of 2020, when things started to percolate to a $483 stock. There are some people who, who made money and it's still you know, adjusting for splits and things like that. It's still above where it, where it was for various complicated reasons. Some of them just purely psychological, not financial, because it's continued to lose money. It's been through, I, I guess, now seven CEOs since our story begins, has not wow. made a, a, a <laughs> penny of profit. Um, you know, but is the stock price is higher? So I guess if you bought early in the mania and then held on, and that was part of the ethos, was just holding on and never selling, you're still up. Certainly, people who got in were very cynical. And, and then sold at or even after, slightly after the peak, made a ton of money. And the people, and the, I'm talking about the bulk of people who got involved in this. And I, I have three sons in, in all in the age cohort that would have been doing this, ranging from now from 17 to 24, uh, who got excited about the 17 year old is too young to have their own brokerage account, but there were people who, who did it. Certainly 24 year olds were in the sweet spot. Uh, I, I know that their friends were in it. And, um, you know, some of them made money, a lot of them lost money. The people who, who heard about it on social media, the week that this thing became a national sensation, the week that GameStop became the most traded security on planet Earth, though most of those people <laughs> lost money, especially the people who saw it as a cause, who, who said, I'm going to mm. put my little bit of money into this thing and I'm going to hang on and never sell because this is the way to, to hurt Stick it to the man. and hurt the yeah. short sellers. They, they lost for sure. I mean, they're down quite a bit. So. Yeah, this is not a monolith. And and as a group, perhaps they made money. Uh, Melvin Capital's loss was more than GameStop because it, any anything that was a, a, a bad stock. So if you ran a and he, he was not a pure short seller, of course, he, he ran a he, long short fund. He was he was net long um, and he traded consumer uh, stocks, consumer and retail stocks. You know, the, the rest of his portfolio also did very poorly because, you know, the, the things that he was long were were pummeled and the things that he were other stocks that he was short uh, went through the roof. You know, nowhere in his risk management did this uh, did this show up that like, you know, the, what's the worst thing that can happen? You're, you're short a stock at, at, at 
you know, let's say, I think he entered into this short position at 20 bucks, right? He, he was one of the first shorts that he opened. The stock went down as far as $2. He saw it going to zero. So he never closed out and mm. he increased his short position as, as it rose. What's the worst case scenario is that someone shows up and buys this for $8 for $10, right? I mean, that'd be a very bad day for you if you had a big short position in a stock, but you don't see something going to $400. There's no, you know, way that that happens. It, and, you know, I think that, you know, it is kind of his fault because this was being talked about openly on social media. And so what really struck me initially about this, and I, I sent a, a, an email to the acquisitions editor at Portfolio, which is the imprint of Penguin Random House that published my book. I said, this is a stock corner or an attempted stock corner. That has not happened for almost a hundred years since the securities laws were written. And I think this is completely legal because I'm reading about this on social media and they're discussing it openly and they're discussing the most efficient way to do it, which is a gamma squeeze. They're talking about all, all the, the strategies openly and, and who they're going to screw over. And because it was a few hundred thousand people doing it out in the open, all documented, I don't think it was illegal at all. Whereas, you know, if, if you two got together and did it, uh, discussed it over the phone and did it, you, you'd be uh, getting- we'd be, the, we'd be the Hunt brothers. Yeah. Spencer, just let me do some shout outs. I always like to shout out uh, where our listeners have come in from. Uh, Senator Domingo, Dominican Republic, Dubai. What's up, Samson? Brandon, Mississippi. Porto de Mos, Portugal, congratulations. Tikva, Peta Tikva, Israel, hope you're staying safe. Marita, Mexico, Surrey, oh, what's up? Savin Lina, Finland, good to see you. Copenhagen, Scotland, London, Wildwood Crest, New Jersey, Kennesaw, Georgia, Leeds, UK. Yeah, worldwide. Got a few more here. There's, there's uh, quite a few. There's a, we'll do a little, get a quick little veggie segment, just uh, short out of the way here. But the, um, you know, supposedly, Ant eaters, you know, obviously it's in their name. They eat ants. Uh, that's their their how they get sustenance. But apparently, a swarm of ants can organize and swarm the the ant eater so much that they actually suffocate the ant eater um, by you know crawling into its its nose and and uh, breath passageway. So, is there? Do you think that that's a reasonable analog of you know these little? you know, smaller day traders who are trying to, you know, be the little ants that are swarming the Melvin Capital anteater? Yeah, I think that's a great, uh, that's a kind of horrifying image in my mind right now, but I think that's uh, that's actually a, a great analogy. I wish I had thought of, um, I didn't know that that could happen to anteaters, but I guess why not? Yeah, I mean, it, you're right, because it, it's a great analogy in the sense that you get your sustenance from this stuff, right? And and then in a kind of a freak occurrence, um, you can be um, you destroyed and, and, and die, which is what happened to Melvin Capital. And after my book came out, Melvin Capital finally kind of shut its doors and went out of business. And you, you think about what you, what you do as a, well, you're a, a, whether you're just a long only uh, investor, but certainly if you're a long short investor, you're trying to find securities that are, are mispriced. And if you're long short, you're looking for securities that are mispriced on the other side, where people uh, are just, you know, just kind of have too much hope, and something's a, a fraud or a, you know, or just hope, you know, going to go bankrupt. I mean, GameStop wasn't a fraud at any point; it just was kind of a, a doomed business model. I and mean, GameStop, at the the time that these events occur, for those not familiar with it and don't have um, teenage boys or or sons in their young twenties, it, it's a place I visited a lot uh, with them. I drove them to to GameStop a lot. It's something that um, it takes on a special resonance for the group that that led this because they they had this kind of cartoon villainish view of uh, of hedge fund managers as being evil. This is the um, Occupy Wall Street generation. This is a generation whose formative financial experiences before they ever had any money to invest was uh, their parents or their parents' friends losing money, perhaps losing their homes during the, the global financial crisis and the housing crisis, the housing crash. And they also grew up going to GameStop if there were men uh, in this country. Uh, GameStop was a place where you, you took your old games and traded them in for new ones. And that's how they made most of their money, actually. Uh, they, they don't make it 
uh, very much money selling you a, a PlayStation 5. They make, because uh, anybody can do that and you know what the price is and you can buy it from Best Buy or buy it online. They made a lot of their money from analog games that were on cassettes or discs. People bought them, bought used ones, brought in the old ones, they were no longer needed and they got a completely fleeced as my sons did on a regular basis. And <laughs> they made like 40% margins on that. Sure. But when a, a business becomes uh, digitized as video games did, and I, I know this from my sons, they would just say, I'm not gonna go and buy this. I'm gonna buy it online right now. It comes out at midnight, comes out at 12.01. I'm buying it at 12.01 and they'd stay up until six in the morning playing a game. They didn't need to go to any GameStop physical store to buy it. And it was great for the video game publishers because there's no middleman, there's no margin to give up. There's no physical media to ship and you can't then go and trade it in and then have someone else forego paying for that physical media. It's, it's, it's a not completely, but very heavily digitized uh, form of entertainment. And so if you're a blockbuster, you know, when streaming is rising, that's very bad news for you. Um, and if you're GameStop, when digitized video games are on the rise and, you know, it's very bad news for you. And so I think Gabe Plotkin was correct in his analysis of this company kind of circling the drain. He had not made money in years, uh, but he made a huge miscalculation. And um, I, I happened, I write in the book, I happened to know that people at his fund were aware that it was being written about on social media. They just didn't take it seriously. They didn't think that there was anything to worry about with these people. So this is a very long answer to your anteater analogy, but you know they, they were, he, he thought instead of being a $4 stock, it was a $2 or a $0 stock at best. And so there was more juice to squeeze out of it. And he failed to recognize the risk. And the risk, one, one part of the risk should have been very obvious to him, which is that the uh, net short interest as a percentage of the float rose as high as 140%, Huge. you know, so that, that should have, have given him pause. If, you know, not what he read on social media, be like, okay, this is, this is getting a little rich and I could, you know, lose a lot of money, but it's such a small position and such a large fund that I guess he thought that he could ride it out. And, and obviously that's not what happened. What is funny is it was the, it was the small. Uh, Toby went into the matrix. I have a question while Toby's getting back in. Is I, I'm reading still about zero, uh, you know, day expiry that are still happening even now. Mm -hmm. Like, so is the is the story completely t finished yet? I mean, is or we still no, have we, some other things <laughs> to go here? No, it's not. Um, so whenever you you have something, um, you know, let's say you you read about. Um, I, I'm I'm trying not to be condescending, but I'm just gonna this is gonna sound a little bit that way. You you read about. Um, some teenagers doing some dumb prank, you know, online. You see five or six or ten copycats of it right. all over the country, and um, it, you know, let's say it was some epic stunt. The 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 next five don't quite work out that way, and, and <laughs> often blow up into people's faces. And so this, there there have been many many echoes of, of this, and people using some of the same tools to recreate it. And so there have been a lot of, I mean, I mean, Bed Bath and Beyond. Is the perfect example. You know, if you were, unless you you got out, you know, you you are at zero in Bed Bath and Beyond. Certainly, if you bought call options, um, you you probably lost money because you usually do lose lose money buying call options. But people tried to replicate, to use the techniques learned in this, um, which were discussed openly in the message boards, to create a, a gamma squeeze, and not necessarily zero day options, which are a, a kind of a more recent kind of development. I mean, they existed then, but but the equivalent of zero day options, right? You had options that were expiring uh, you know, in a few days or in a week. Um, you get the most bang for your buck. Uh, if you want to make a stock go up, if it's a, a $5 stock and you buy a, a $10 strike call maturing in a week, you know, any options dealer it, it will gladly sell you that, but uh, does not even need to hedge at the time that they, they sold it to you. The, the chances of it being in the money are infinitesimal. You're just wasting your money. But the price of purchasing those calls is, is also tiny. Um, so it's just pennies that you're, you're losing. But the, that's, of course, part of the whole strategy. Um, and then the more volatile stock is, and the more that you, know, you have you know, meme stock traders in it, the more expensive it gets. And that, that's why it actually got more expensive to execute these, uh, these gamma squeezes later on. But as you get closer and closer um, to, um, to the, the 
option being the money, even if there's a very small amount of time left, the options dealers need to use their own money. Um, they're not losing money, but they need to use their own money to purchase the stock. And there's a formula that tells them how much they have to purchase. Uh, even when, let's say, that $10 stock is at $10.50, they're not completely hedged in the, in the stock. Uh, but they've gone from owning none of it to owning quite a bit of it uh, when all they received was, was pennies. And, and then they close out that, that position as soon as, um, you know, as soon as the option has expired. And so it's, it's like a, a weapon of mass destruction. I mean, I know that I'm stealing from Warren Buffett who called derivatives weapons of mass destruction, but it's, it's like, a, like a suitcase nuke or something, you know, where like, mm. you know, you're, you're taking something that's very small and innocuous and cheap and not very sophisticated and you're, you're using it to create mischief. You're not necessarily going to make money because you're probably going to lose money. You know, your, your expected payoff is, is really low. Um, but that's not why you did it. You did it to create mischief. And so that's, that's something pretty new, right? That's, that is something that did not exist before where these, the whole payoff to these, these people was, was psychic and in terms of the, the damage that they caused to some cartoon villain out on Wall Street who was uh, shorting this thing. And they, 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 they conflated shorting a, a stock with trying to destroy a company, which are two different things. Mm -hmm. they, they want to destroy this company that's part of your childhood and how dare they do that? And those greedy bastards. And, and I remember what happened to my, my parents' neighbor lost their home and that was hedge funds too. And let's, let's have some fun and, and ruin their day and cost them a few billion dollars. So it was all a lot of fun, um, but it wasn't for the vast majority of people who participated, it wasn't a very profitable exercise and the options dealers loved it. I mean, the, the amount of turnover even today is, is far higher than it, than it was. And it's just a, it's a casino, uh, basically, because your your expected return is is negative. You know, in uh, purchasing calls or puts as an individual investor, for sure, uh, because the bid ask is really wide. Um, I mean, I, we could discuss. I'm sure you you and most of your your listeners understand that. But um, yeah, you know, all the friction is hard to get over. Don't speculate in options. Don't do it. You know. Yeah, they say sell vol until you ball. Sell vol, don't buy vol. Yeah, until you ball. <laughs> uh, th that revolutionary fervor, you, you, you sort of say that the revolution wasn't, but I certainly see that revolutionary fervor in lots of other names besides GameStop. I think that the crowd started in GameStop, but they've kind of moved on to other things. And one, one stock that I don't know if you follow AMC at all. I don't really follow yes, it closely. I'm very familiar but with the goings on there, yeah. I find it it's such a strange place to have made the stand do you know what i mean like they're, they're mm -hmm. in there expecting this mother of all short squeezes mm -hmm. to occur at some point i, I just i just don't it's i'm kind of i'm i find it like i, I find it a little bit hard to look away every time i see it i i, I want to just kind of get an update with what these guys are doing but that it's the, the tape in it is terrible the price is down so much i don't know it would really have to be the mother of all, the grandmother of all short squeezes at this point to get back to break even. Do you, do you feel like that's the same attitude that we're going to stick it to they, whoever they are? Yeah, yeah. Except, except in in the case of the mother of all short squeezes, it's based on, um, like you 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 take two or three facts that are actual facts, um, you know some financial information that's available to the public or available for a, you know, a subscription, um, you know, through FactSet or, or whatever. And you conflate that with um, there are counterfeit shares and these hedge funds haven't closed their positions. The, for those not, not yeah. uh, au fait with the mother of all short squeezes also just, just goes by the acronym MOAS. Go, go on the, in, the internet and do hashtag MOASS and, um, read away but don't don't um don't buy it so it just takes a few yeah. facts uh that are are true and a few conjectures which are are not true and conflates into it's like there's this gigantic payoff that's going to bankrupt all these big hedge funds uh because they haven't closed their short positions in um amc which is a movie theater chain amc went up a whole bunch during the same time that GameStop went up. There were seven or eight stocks, or 13 in all, if you want to really broadly define them, that were meme stocks, but seven or eight. And what they all had in common was they were all sort of these relics of, uh, of the recent past 
uh, that uh, were really either hurt by their faulty business models or hurt by the pandemic. So you had BlackBerry, the maker, mm -hmm. uh, you know, before the iPhone took over, the maker of uh, the leading smartphone uh, maker. You had, um, you know, Bed Bath and Beyond, which was being Amazon out of business, and that was out of business. Uh, you had GameStop, of course, and you had AMC and a few others. You had a, a wired stereo head, you know, headset maker and a bunch of other stocks. And what they all had in common was they, people just did a scan on Yahoo Finance or whatever, and they saw what had very heavy net short interest. And so they started picking on those and they, they, they had tended to have those in common. And AMC was the place where, of course, all these people went to go see all the Avenger movies and whatever. And so that was also a business being put out. But AMC, the difference there was that the, the people who were in the management of AMC uh, embraced this movement. And so Adam Aaron, who is still the CEO of AMC, uh, was really bailed out. They were months away from, from bankruptcy. They had a bunch of converts that were headed to zero. They had, um, they, they had taken on very, very um, unfavorable debt during the, the, the pandemic. And they, they were you know, just kind of breathing their last breaths. And they're, they're not profitable today, but they're, uh, they have been recapitalized to a large extent because of the, the uh, meme stock traders. And so people ask, how are these businesses, how is Game, GameStop too, to a lesser extent, how are they still going um, if, if they were businesses that were supposed to be going bankrupt? And part of the answer is that they, they recapitalize themselves. And if you wanna talk about it later, we can put Tesla in the, the same bucket. Tesla- The equity uh, issuance. Three or four years ago, yeah. I mean, if you're, you're going, you have a very high stock valuation, but you're running out of, out, out of money, by making making people believe or creating a kind of cult status around your your stock, and then raising money at that um, kind of unrealistic valuation, you can do it again and again, and you can turn yourself. It doesn't make necessarily make that investment that people made at that very rich valuation a good investment. It usually doesn't, right? If you sell overpriced stock to people, the people who bought the overpriced stock are not going to be happy. Um, well, they might be in Tesla's case if they sold today because they it turned out to good, be a good buy. But AMC is the poster child for that. The And it's also a poster child, in my opinion, for uh, executives just being in the right place at the right time. Adam Aaron, um, my math might be wrong, but I think he's personally sold about $94 million uh, in, in stock, either sold or given to relatives $94 million in stock. He has a lot more to sell. They uh, launched, they, they got to the point where they couldn't raise uh, more equity uh, because they had no more authorized share capital. They were- uh, We need a board vote. on that front. <laughs> and so they, with a bit of financial engineering, they lo launched, and the people who were in, in the stock are called apes. They call themselves apes. Uh, they launched- Apes uh, together uh, strong. Yeah, the apes forever strong. And they, they launched um, uh, preferred stock. Uh, which they did have, and the preferred stock, the terms of the preferred stock, the special class of preferred stock were economically identical to their common stock, uh, but it was preferred and they could sell much more of that one. And that had the ticker APE. And inexplicably for a long, long time, APE, APE and AMC traded a very wide gulf. So Jim Chanos, the short seller actually, uh, and I'm not sure wh where that stands today, it's, uh, APE it doesn't, you know, it's been, doesn't exist now, but there was a long period of time where APE and AMC, be, despite being economic identical because all the people who owned it didn't know what they were doing, had a very, very wide spread from each other. But that didn't matter. That was all part of the plan to recapitalize the company. And you know, normally you'd think if you're, you kind of have any kind of fiduciary duty, you have two classes of stock that are economically identical. Am I going to sell and dilute my shareholders by selling the much cheaper version of, of that equity? Well, it doesn't really seem like uh, a totally upstanding thing to do, uh, but that's what they did because that was the, the security that they could, could sell to, to stay in, in business. And, uh, and now they've, they've unified the two classes of, of stock. And so there's way more shares outstanding than there were at the time of the meme stock squeeze. And that company you know, probably will live to fight another day. They, they have you know, enough enough stock to keep going. And of course the pandemic is, well, I, te I guess technically we're still in the pandemic, but the acute emergency phase of the pandemic is over and people are going to movie theaters again. And so the real cash crunch period is, is behind them. Uh, but it's a crazy story um, with many crazy chapters, Moas. I mean, look it up and <laughs> don't, you know, 
don't take it too seriously. Careful. But it's, yeah, those searches. Uh, I get a lot of hate mail whenever I, I kind of raise it in a tweet or or in, in an article. Our, our, I didn't know our, they could read. The Wall Street Journal and sister <laughs> publications, if they, if they write about it, you know, they kind of get cyber bullied, basically, uh, by by people who sort of, I, I don't know, I, I think I it's not nice, but it's kind of the QAnon of, of finance, I guess, is what someone called it. And I think that's not, that's, that's it's not far wrong. Mm. Uh, one of the other sort of interesting things that happened through that period was anytime a company went into bankruptcy and it got the queue on the end of it, it was like the, like a the seal moon. of approval. <laughs> yeah. It was yeah. like a, when Hertz got the queue, it went absolutely yeah. bananas. Did you follow yeah, Did you follow so, Hertz? The, the, yeah. The crazy thing there is because it had happened before. So imagine, I mean, you're, you're a young person and you heard about a friend or a friend of a friend, or you read online, uh, someone who, who doubled or quadrupled their money when the stock got the queue and you don't, and not all queues are created equal, right? There, there are, are some stocks in bankruptcy where there is some recovery, where you can yeah. make money if you have a very sophisticated understanding. Is queue for uh, quality? Is that what the... No, no I don't think that that... <laughs> oh, that's, okay. uh, I think that might not be it. Um, but you know, it was obviously, the, you know, there are many companies where it is very clear that you're not going to, to recover anything, that you're, the, this thing still trades, but you're not going to make money. But it doesn't matter. If you if you bought it at a, a buck and sold it at two bucks, you made a hundred percent. And the poor guy, the kind of the greater fool who bought it at two bucks, maybe he or she sold it at three bucks and made fifty percent, and so on and so forth until someone got left holding the bag. And so the fact that that someone, it's just like someone winning the lottery. You know, you, it's it, mathematically, I think the vast majority of people they it's it's not right to call the lottery a like a, a tax on a numeracy. Um, because I think most people understand that the expected return of a, a lottery ticket, a Powerball ticket, is is negative, right? But they still buy it because they read about someone who made a lot of money and they want to dream and they think that they, they'll hope. be lucky this time. And so that's I think that that the kind of greater fool, and that that is the kind of saddest thing, you know, about this um, this whole episode and all the kind of echoes of it uh, is that the young people who have gotten into investing, I view it as a good thing because young people are not, we're not interested enough in, in investing and having brokerage accounts and having starting 401ks or IRAs or what have you before this. And, and now they got into investing, but too many of them um, view this, first of all, they view it as a kind of get rich quick and kind of greater fool theory, which is not the, obviously not the path to, to riches. It's a uh, you're going to be a net loser uh, as a group doing that, right? Uh, because there, you do need a greater fool. And the greater fool is, you know, when things are really elevated is definitely going to be coming from that cohort. It's not going to be coming from some hedge fund. Um, so, you're, you know, it, you, you need someone to lose in order for you to, to have that walk away with that gain. But the other thing is that, that then there are all these MOAS and other conspiracy theories where they blame some shadowy cabal uh, of being behind their losses rather than their own stupidity and greed. And, and then they just get disgusted with investing with Wall Street. And what's the most expensive thing? You know, if you lose $500 or $1,000 when you're 23 years old, it's not that big of a deal. You lost $1,000, so what? It's in terms of tuition, um, you know, that's pretty cheap. You know, if you kind of wake mm -hmm. up, and I do know people, and you probably do know people too, who made dumb financial and investing mistakes and said, you know what, I, I'm going to just be kind of follow the straight and narrow and maybe buy a, a book or, um, or watch and acquires multiple uh, podcasts or whatever and understand. What no, they're I, trying what to I'm make money, what sir. What do you <laughs> I was right, I mean, say. understand what the long term formula is for success over decades, right? That's a good thing. But that's a, uh, unfortunately, it's going to be a, a small minority of the people who got caught up in this thing. Um, I think also a small minority get wrapped up and it's a really small, small vocal group of people who believe in MOAS and what have you and think it's a conspiracy. I don't think that's that many people either. I mean, tens of thousands maybe, you know, who are, who are really obsessed with this. And, and the, the remainder, I think are just going to be disillusioned and say the stock market is rigged and it's not for me. And I'm going to, I don't know, buy cryptocurrency or, or not save or not set up an account. And, and that, you know, measured over decades is going to cost them a lot of money, right? Be the, the fact that they're not 
you know, multiplying their wealth. You can, you can add up your wealth. You can put your money in a bank account and, and, you know, addition will only get you so far. It's, it's multiplication that, that gets you a big nest egg and compounding and, and, and they're going to forego that, which is really a shame. Right. And so that's, that, that I think is the kind of the saddest, most expensive outcome of, of this, this ethos that emerged the last few years uh, among the newest investors. What do you think about naked shorting? Well, so naked shorting became much more difficult. Naked, naked shorting, to be clear, is uh, shorting a stock without locating a borrow. So you, you, know, you, you can sell a stock short pretty easily, but you need to, if you're a hedge fund or whoever, you need to locate a borrow. And there was not a, a lot of naked shorting that went on during this episode because it has become much more difficult because of regulation SHO. Uh, but naked shorting did occur and it happened because of something I don't want to bore you put your your viewers to sleep but the details something called rehypothecation which is that imagine that you know you have a hedge fund and you located a borrow and you shorted a stock that you thought was going to go down in value you sold it to someone there's a buyer on the the other side um, and that buyer has it in their brokerage account and their broker then says hey there's some stock uh, shares here and this very this stock with a you know that I can make a lot of money lending out I'm going to lend it out to someone else and it gets lent out twice. And so that's how you get to 140% net short. Uh, shouldn't happen, but it does. It's not a, a shadowy conspiracy, um, but of course it, it shouldn't happen. It's, it's kind of a clerical issue more than anything than a kind of an evil plot to drive shares to zero. And again, I just wanna emphasize that if, if you find a company that's overvalued or perhaps fraudulent, or there's a lot of red flags about it, and you sell it short, you're not destroying the company. You are uh, making a bet against the company. It's two different things. Uh, but as a matter of fact, there's a great study uh, that came out in the, in the early 2000s. I, I'm, I apologize, I'm forgetting the, the author's name. It's an academic study saying that executives who, who complain about short sellers, including naked short sellers, those are excellent stocks to short. Uh, the, you know, the, the odds <laughs> of a company like that going bankrupt, and there's a great story, and I verify that this is true, that uh, Dick Fold was uh, was given a copy of this uh, this academic paper by someone, and just said this is bullshit, and kind of just said don't don't show me this, you know. But you know, we all know how that ended. So, you know, companies that that complain about short sellers are maybe not in the short run because they, you know, obviously they can. You know, you can lose your shirt in the short run, but uh, in the long run, tend to be uh, good companies to bet against, or, or like poor stocks to buy. Let's put it that way. The, the research is pretty clear that you don't want to be short things that are too heavily shorted because yeah, um, you, you com you're competing for the short. It's it's a crowded short, and you, you're going to pay a lot. And that's one of the we, we have a comment here that says that one of the reasons that the AMC APE spread remained so wide was that the the short lending cost was was very high evidently to, to get I mean, in there. I, I spoke I spoke to and, and quoted Jim Chano, Chanos for a piece that I wrote. So I, I, I didn't follow it over the, I guess, more than a year that it was outstanding or, um, yeah, maybe not, maybe not more than a year, but the many, many months it was outstanding and was a security. It was, the cost to borrow was like 20 something percent. So yeah, not okay. astronomical at that time, but it could have changed. And yeah, it probably was difficult to short. And 23% is pretty high given that, um, for you know, dur let's say during the meme stock squeeze, um, a typical stock would have cost you less than a percent, you know, to 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 short in terms of cost to borrow. That's when interest rates were zero, of course. There's a there's a question here. Did they change how the short interest report? There is the, I, I'm not. There has been a change to how shorts are reported. I'm not sure. Do you, do you know Spencer? What's what's happened there? There was a proposed change. I don't think there was any any rule change. I think the SEC. Of course, the, the SEC com, comes out of this and they, um, you know, who, who do you blame, you know, for the, the episode? Uh, you blame short sellers for the, the episode, which is, um, I think they, they really should have looked else, elsewhere. They did also look elsewhere, but the kind of reports that came out of it said, well, we need to reform the way that short selling happens and there needs to be fuller reporting of, of short positions, even small short positions. I don't think that the the rule changed, although I'm not an expert on um, on market regulation. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously you have to be much more careful and you have to be much more cognizant of uh, what's happening on social media. And if you're short a stock that um, where there's heavy short interest, first of all, you, obviously, as you said, you should not, 
it's very dangerous to short a stock where where a lot of people have noticed the same thing you did and and sold it short because you know the Keynes didn't say it, but uh, he's widely quoted as saying the market can uh, remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent, and that that holds true. I mean, your your losses are capped at infinity uh, for a, a short sale, uh, and and your gain, your maximum gain is 100%. So it's a very asymmetric payoff, and you need to be really really careful about what you're doing, even if you're Gabe Plotkin and it's just one, you know, not particularly huge short position within a, a very large, uh, I think the fund was $13 billion at the time. And the market value, the summer of, uh, of, of 2020, the market value of all of GameStop was a few hundred million dollars. I wasn't aware that Keynes hadn't said that, but now that you say that he hadn't said that, it doesn't sound, he would never have said anything in no, fewer no. than 50 words. I don't think he wrote a sentence. No, no, it wasn't not, a run on sentences no, it's in his entire life. That's yeah, how you know. If you, um, you know, keep a, a copy of Bartlett's familiar quotations, there are a lot of things that, that people didn't say. Um, I mean, they're great. Someone said them, but not them. JT, have you got, have you got uh, veggies there? Was that, was that our veggies earlier? No, no, I've got something. We can. We, ha uh... we have, uh, Spencer, we have, we serve vegetables every time we, we do this. We, we've had uh, the, we have some dessert later, but vegetables are the learning portion of the, of the podcast. Okay. That, that Jake delivers. So this week's uh, veggies are on Batesian mimicry. Uh, and this is another segment that I pulled from uh, that book, What I Learned About Investing from Darwin by Pulak Prasad. Um, and so Batesian mimicry is when a harmless species has evolved to imitate the warning signals of a harmful species. Mm -hmm. And it's typically directed at a predator that would be trying to eat them. Uh, and it's named after this English naturalist named Henry Walter Bates after he worked on butterflies in the rainforest of Brazil and um, oh, for over a decade, like from 1848 to, to 1858. And actually the first four years that he was working there, he was there with Alfred uh, Russell Wallace, who was kind of famously co-discovered, but doesn't get as much credit as Darwin for uh, natural selection. Uh, so anyway, Bates collected all of these, you know, hundred butterflies, and he's while he's sorting them, he discovers that some looked alike, but they actually weren't even closely related at all. Uh, and so it was kind of a bit of a mystery there. And he put forward the hypothesis that you know close resemblance between unrelated species was this anti-predator adaption, and you know. He noted that, um, you know, some showed very striking coloration and, and they flew around leisurely, almost as if they were taunting predators to eat them, uh, which is kind of funny. Uh, but, you know, he, the the birds were basically like reasoned that these butterflies were unpalatable based on the color and avoided them. Uh, and so basically they they were parasitizing these these signals that were honest signals from another particular species so that they, you know, th this Batesian mimicry gained them an advantage without having to actually go to the expense of arming themselves with poison or, you know, the toxicity or whatever that might be expensive to, to create. So, um, and maybe the best known example of this is the milk snake that looks like the deadly coral snake, but it's actually harmless, right? Um, and it could also be used for attraction. So apparently, you know, these large male green frogs will advertise their size and dominance by croaking at a lower frequency than smaller frogs. And that's probably just has to do with like the size of them and the, the vibration, but the, uh, and then female frogs will be attracted to these, you know, low frequencies and smaller frogs have now, uh, or have evolved the ability to copy that low frequency of the bigger frogs. <laughs> and like, they'll preserve their territory by fooling larger males from even coming in and also, you know, attracting mates. <laughs> And uh, I was thinking, you know, maybe the uh, like super lifted trucks is the human form of <laughs> Batesian mimicry of <laughs> pretending that you're a macho man. Um, anyway, and it also sometimes doesn't work out so well for one party. Um, there's a certain species of fireflies that that the females mimic the mating signals of another species and mm -hmm. they'll deceive the males into coming close enough and then they'll eat them. Uh, so, oh, no. okay. yeah. Uh, so. Then to add to our story here, 1975, an, an Israeli evolutionary biologist named Amor is Amor's Zahavi, I believe is how it's pronounced. And he proposed this concept called the handicap principle. And his hypothesis was that a signal that is costly pr to produce, the receiver can then interpret that it's actually an honest trade and isn't Bayesian mimicry, basically. So mm -hmm. the pe peacock is kind of a classical example of this, right? It's it's very expensive to have this large, colorful tail that attracts a lot of attention from predators, 
but what it, the females see that and they see it as a sign of biological fitness and then they want to mate with that 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 male so um so let's what can we do think about this in the the world of investing in business like what can we draw from this um and prasad says that you know we should only look and give credence to those signals from companies which are actually costly to produce so you mm -hmm. think about press releases you know talk tends to be pretty cheap there like management can highlight whatever they want they can spin it how they want management interviews as well are, are pretty comparable to that you know there's lots of bromides and talking points and rarely is it costly for them to point out you know what what would actually you might consider an honest signal uh, like every company is innovating, every company is leveraging technology, uh, right? Like, but what does that AI, mean? AI, AI, AI. Yeah, exactly. That's all cheap, right? Um, you know, conferences and road shows that they show up to, not really much different. So but what about like earnings guidance? This one's kind of interesting. Like, you know, the worst case is, is probably, you know, Jack Welch and his time at GE where right. they had slush funds that were basically used so they could hit earnings right up to the penny. Uh, but there was a McKinsey study that came out about earnings guidance, and it found that the, the ev there's no evidence that that providing earnings guidance affects valuation multiples, shareholder returns, or share price volatility. Uh, the only significant effect that it found, and this kind of ties in, Spencer, some of the things you were talking about, the you know, churn, is that it increases trading volumes. So the brokers are kind of the only ones who win in this thing. Right. <laughs> uh, so true honest signals then like what what can we look for for that like th it tends to be more historical like them telling you something history like our average margin over the last 10 years was 12 percent, or based on recent history we've launched one product over the last three years instead of we're going to do six projects in the next year right but what have you done historically mm -hmm. um and probably the most honest statements and signals come from the proxy statement uh, mm -hmm. that's where you find skin in the game uh, this is like what, I, you know, might look at some of Mike non-gaps, uh, dark arts things that he's written right. up if you want to search for that. You know, how's management incentivized? What are their salaries? What KPIs are they they tied to? Are they sandbagging? You know, what do the equity grants look like and the stock price right. for their options? How's the board ensuring the talent is retained and incentivized, especially if their existing options are underwater, which is kind of a, you know, a more recent phenomenon. Yeah. Um and two special things that might be look out for, especially are what are called like spring loading and then bullet dodging. And they're kind of the same thing, but opposite sides. Spring loading is when you grant options right before there's a big positive news event. And then bullet dodging is when you delay to grant options until after a negative news event has happened and, and you kind of like sandbag and torpedo the stock price potentially. Uh, and both are, you know, kind of fall within a gray area, I think, as far as insider trading goes. But uh doesn't seem to be high up on the SEC's list of 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 things to worry about. Uh, but anyway, those are you know Batesian mimicry in the in the investment world. I think happens a lot where people, you know, they'll talk like you know talking like the outsiders book. You know, they'll they'll mm -hmm. pretend to be iconoclastic. But where does it actually show up? Like, what are the real signals that are costly for them to produce, not just talk? Um, and that and looking for those and trying to separate out costly from not costly will help you to understand. You know, when are you when are you dealing with the milk snake versus the the coral snake? Yeah, I mean, I, I I feel like I mean this is obviously doesn't really apply to to the the meme stocks and things like that, but I, I feel like what's what's really precious. And I, I apologize, my dog is uh, barking. He won't I, he won't stop if I ask him to uh, stop barking. <laughs> um, is is what a company does with its cash and does consistently with its cash. I mean, mm -hmm. cash is is precious. You can't. You can't print it. You can print up more shares. You can't print up more uh, more cash. And so companies that um, that act in a, a very very consistent way in terms of their capital structure, I think, tend to be some of the the, the best companies. Um, and I'm thinking uh, I'll, I'll to off the top of my head, Costco and AutoZone that uh, that I've, I've observed that they uh, are very very consistent at not uh, not expanding too quickly, right? Mm -hmm. Not kind of not empire building. Um, having a very consistent um, degree of leverage, a very uh, consistent cash payout, you know, kind of shareholder yield between uh, buybacks and and dividends, and and they don't vary it. They don't try to to time the market. Um, you know, you can people. I just find one of the the dumbest things that people will say is uh, th this company did stock buybacks. Uh, last year when the share price was 90 and now the share price is 60 
And uh, as a shareholder, I'm outraged that they wasted money. Like, well, you were a shareholder at 90. You didn't see that it, the stock was going to go to 60. I mean, why didn't you sell if you yeah. had, you know, if you felt that way? I mean, hindsight is 2020. I mean, we, we do know that companies um, are very poor market timers, right? I mean, they- yeah, they counter cyclical. Totally. I mean, it's, it is unfortunately it's counter cyclical and well, mutual fund investors and everything else. I mean, it's all like, you know, should zig when, when they're zagging. Uh, so I, I don't think the companies, that's the bad thing about, about buybacks, whereas like the financially it's very similar to, uh, um, to a dividend, uh, except you're not committing yourself. You know, you, you really, it's a, an embarrassing climb down if you cut your dividend. Whereas if you sort of just quietly halt buybacks or a program comes to an end or, or whatever, it's, it's totally, at your discretion, and so companies tend to make bad choices. But I mean, those companies that are that are very consistent, like a, across a cycle, uh, in terms of you know how they how they deploy cash, which they can't create. You know, I think those those are the ones that um, kind of have skin in the game. You know, and then also, and then just AutoZone. I don't know Costco. One of the more surprising things as a financial journalist that ever happened to me was I was when I was writing ahead of the tape was this daily investing column in the Wall Street Journal that doesn't exist anymore. It was in the front of the money investing section for many years. I was the guy who wrote it every day. And I wrote about all kinds of companies and Costco came up and I, I wasn't very familiar with Costco. And so in the process of researching it, writing up there, you know, what their results were going to mean and look like, I called up the company. There was a number at the bottom of the press release. And the, the guy who picked up the phone, I, I took me a few minutes to realize I was talking to the CFO, like no secretary. Oh, no so is it Jim Senegal? Costco's You're just <laughs> chatting with him on the <laughs> retailer in the US. I mean, that's, first of all, he was very helpful and, and, and candid, but uh, also he picked up his own phone and, and spent time speaking with me. And, uh, you know, what better sign do you, do you need than that? And so, you know, it's like another one of those those kind of intangibles. Like you go to their their headquarters and it's not very nice, and the furniture is not very good, and it's not in a great part of town. And they didn't really, you know, you know, they don't have like a lot, lot of perks. They're they're spending the money on the the parts of the business that matter. I mean, um, th those are those are signals as well. You know, if you know what to look for, it doesn't yeah, always work. And those are course, actually costly. You know, that, that's, that, those things mean mean something to me. Management's flying coach. Like that's that's a cost yeah. to them. You know. And so that's those are the signals you should probably keep an eye on. Yeah. Right, veggies, JT. Buybacks is a good example because more buybacks are announced than are completed, because people know that you get a little bounce when you announce a buyback, and then you know it's free. You don't have to go and complete the buyback; you've already got the bounce that you wanted. And then looking back historically, that's that's the best measure: who has who has bought back a material sum of shares over the last whatever one, three, five years, and is undervalued. But you make a good point, Spence, that if they knew, if you knew at 90 that it was going down, you should have sold if you're unhappy with the buyback at that level. It's unknowable. Right. I mean, there's a lot of scope to complain, right? There are a lot of companies that did buybacks when times were good. Yeah. And then and then halted them when times were bad. And they they should be in theory doing the, the opposite. Um but if they if you do it consistently or if you have uh you know very mechanical criteria for doing it, that's the, that I think is the the best approach. And that applies to investing too, in, in my opinion. I mean, if you, um, you know, not a professional investor, but if you're an individual investor, um, I always tell my, my friends and neighbors who don't get bored of, of hearing about it, you know, if you, you have a, a certain mix of risky and less risky assets that you uh, feel comfortable holding in the, the long run, um, and the stock market has had a great year, then circle the date on the calendar and rebalance on, on that date. I mean, of course, there are funds that will do this for you, uh, but rebalance on, on that date, no matter what, no matter what the headlines say, no matter how good or bad the headlines are on that day, that's the day you're, you're going to do it. And you're going to be a lot of times acting as a, as a contrarian. Uh, but I mean, re the results of, of, of doing that and being unemotional and being mechanical uh, do pay off in the in the long run uh, because it takes your personal bias out of it. Preaching to the choir here. Yes, I say preach. <laughs> uh, when you're, uh, how do you source for hurt on the street? How do you how do you find out what's happening? What's the um, what's the well, mechanism? Well, so um, I, I used to write for the the Lex column, which is a very similar column at the Financial Times, where it, it's it's scrupulously uh, off the record. You you might quote, let's say, a company executive said this or 
President Biden said that, or Janet Yellen said this, but you don't um, you, you don't quote anyone you spoke with. Um, we <clears throat> we're a reported column. You can speak with people. You can cite an expert. Although we often don't, and there are a lot of people, a lot of smart people who who want to to speak with us on, on background. And you know, you know you distill what they what they told you and what you've read, and you have to do your own analysis as well. We're we're an opinion financial opinion and analysis column. So we, uh, you know, you have to know how to read a, a balance sheet. You have to know something about the industry that you're you're writing about. You have to have some uh, kind of deep level of familiarity. Uh, something approaching what a, an analyst is, and that was my, my first career was being a stock analyst, but not, not to the same level of detail. And I think there's an advantage there because uh, first of all, when you're an analyst, analysts are, are very bad at, at picking stocks uh, and telling you, you know their buy sell and hold recommendations are don't work out well um in part because you you have to go through a whole process to change your your recommendation but also you're you don't want to uh, embarrass yourself in front of management you want you know you want to curry favor with them uh but also because you missed the forest for the trees you know you're you're so close to the subject matter you know and as an analyst um you know, i have a pretty good memory for numbers and you know i could Somebody said, "What was that that company's uh, you know EBIT two years ago?" I, I could have told you, uh, but is that a very useful piece of information to have at Instant Recall? Well, not really. You know, you you need to be able to see the big picture and have spoken to their competitors and have some sense of what's going on in the world and industry trends. And analysts spend so much mental energy, you know, with getting those granular details that they they tend to miss the big picture. Whereas a a, a columnist like a heard on the street columnist can um, you know, you, you might not have the same depth, but you, you're, you're broad enough that you can see sometimes spot things uh, well ahead of, of Wall Street. If you're, you're not sourcing in the, in the column, do you require, so some, but someone has said something to you, you have to, what are the ethics of that situation? You have to have that noted somewhere that, that's acknowledged that this is a genuine source. So, so you can avoid a Stephen Glass or whatever his name was the you know, he well, had the juked my chronics. Yeah. Um, look, I mean, it, you, you're, you're speaking, first of all, we can quote people. We can quote sources. We say Bank of America analyst wrote this, said this, the executive in a conversation with the CEO in a conversation with us said this thing. They also <clears throat> can say, this is on background. Let me explain the situation to you. And that can inform our take, and you can put out, take out your bullshit meter, and say, "Well, this person's telling me this thing on background um, does not want to be quoted. How credible is it? How, how, you know, I'm going to not take their word for it. I'm going to cross-check that with what I'm hearing from others, and then I'm going to write what I write." So there are a lot of, of background conversations that can can play into a, a column. I mean, we don't have. Um, I mean, I think what you're talking about is a case of um, of, of someone making up sources, which we, we just can't do, right? I mean, making up quotes, making up sources, um, that that can pretty quickly be found out in a high profile yeah. publication. That that yeah. I don't not aware of that. Save that for that Twitter. Happened, um, <laughs> you know. So that that that's not a a danger. And then of course we don't own. Um, I mean, I personally, because I edit the column, in addition to writing, you know, I, I don't own any individual stocks because anything could potentially be a conflict of interest. So yeah. as much as I'd, I'd like to, I'd, I'd like to, everyone wants to think they're very clever and can kind be of a, a bummer. Really great stock picker. And so I only own stocks virtually. Uh, I don't own stocks for real. I make all kinds of bets with people about this is going to go down and this is going to go up and play stock games and things like that. But I, I just, just ETFs and, and mutual funds and stuff like that. Um, yeah. So I don't think it's. I don't think there's a lot of danger in, in the way that we approach things. It's very ethical, uh, in, in particular with the Wall Street Journal. I mean, I think journalists generally are ethical, but I think we have very, very strict ethics rules at the at the journal. You can't. I can't accept bus fare from a company to go talk <laughs> to them. I, I need to, to pay my. You know, I mean, the journal will compensate me if I get on a plane and go somewhere, but I can't. They can't. They can't put me up in a hotel or anything like that. My limited experience in this was with Jason Zweig, and I couldn't believe the amount of background digging that he did before publishing anything. I mean, it was very yeah. impressive. Yeah, Jason is a, 
Jason is great. He's amazing. Um, he is, uh, he's like a national treasure as far as I'm concerned. It's, it's great to just, I mean, you don't want to bother him because he's just doing such important stuff. But I mean, if you have a question <laughs> right. about anything investing or securities related, you know, you could walk over to him and he's, he's just such a, a, a generous soul and will will know. He doesn't even have to look it up. You know, he, he, he'll know it. You know, he'll remember it. You know, he's, he's like a walking encyclopedia. He is, he's great. Uh, that's coming up on time, Spencer. The, the, uh, the name of the book is The Revolution That Wasn't. Spencer Jacob, it's on Penguin Random House. Is that right? It's combined that's the name publisher, now. yeah. And Portfolio is the, the imprint. Yep. And Portfolio. Uh, Spencer, thanks so much for joining us this week. Uh, JT, as always. And folks, uh, we'll be back next week. Uh, same bad time.